Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to be back. I've never been in this hall before, but it's rather lovely. I will begin with a canzone, actually. I'm not going to go to the bother of explaining what this is, but the same words keep coming around and around, and it's a bit like being in a whirlpool, and that's the whole temptation and charm of them. Um, it's a love poem. It's a fantasy after the American poet called Theodore Lethke, who wrote, I knew a woman lovely in her bones. Ah, uh, when she moved, she moved more ways than one, and that's the first line. And this is the longest poem I read, but it's, but it's, it's a fairly deep old world poem. Ah, uh, when she moved, she moved more ways than one, but that's just movement as a cat performs. Beauty not for cats, for anyone, because a movement can be more than one. And several is how they spent the day. And she was several, far more than one, just more perhaps of one than anyone in terms of movement, nothing standing still for long enough, though they themselves stood still while moving on, refusing just a one mode of movement or a fixity of placement, so they kept on moving, place to place. And this is where they were. This was a place where she was moving, every movement one with the next, each fitting into place, then shifting on, discarding sense of place. And he stood by, seeing how grace performs itself and knows its place beyond the place provided for it, never the perfect place. You love the many, and you love the one, but many may be focused into one. You want the thing, you want it in a place, you want it how you want it, to be still, as poised, he thought, as constant, as if still in movement, loving all that remains still in her, her sense of being in a place, not of it. And the essence he made was still a point of stillness and her being still. So when she moved, it was more ways than one, he noted, as she moved, by being still. One might move so and yet remain quite still, he said. It's life that holds her and performs the daily ritual she herself performs. And she performs herself beyond the one still moment of performance in the day that moves past her and will not spare a day. But this was where she moved, it being day she moved through, as though perfectly at one with day and it with her, day after day, with nights to come, the body of the day, turning to sleep and image in the place they lay and moved in, in a dream of day, working its way through body and a day, as though her body, his dream and day were one. Most time is timeless. Time knows only one mood of being rushing through the day, ticking of items, the function it performs, performable, but not what she performs. They were, he thought, what permanence performs, when permanence is saved for just one day. So day performs, so anything performs itself by moving, being what performs, because performance is like standing still while moving. And so everything performs, movement, stillness, whatever thing performs, what happens. And it happens in this place of that, the whole being only the place she moves in, and by moving in, performs. So she, he thought, must clearly be the one who holds the movement still, as if at one with both the stillness and the movement, one moment here or there, then the whole place. Her body moved and then she stopped quite still, still as the world compacted in today, her several parts and all that day performs. What she told me about beauty. It's about aging, I guess, myself and others. Hard to lose beauty, she said, and was beautiful as she said the words. It is not the same later, she said, that we say it is, it isn't. And that troubles me if only for a moment, she added. How sad to consider it, all that gradual vanishing, all soft power gone. So she reflected lost in her beautiful bones, her beautiful mouth, moving as mouths do in the saying of such things in their full moment. But that may be what beauty is, the loss of it, just before the loss, each moment of it, she said, and took a deep breath of plentiful air, the air being good, the moment, just one moment, that moment, 
right thing. This is a poem which began with a single overheard line. The poem is called Overheard. Um, the line overheard was, That night I spent my last nickel to call Steve. That then is the first line of the poem, and this is what then follows from it. Overheard. That night I spent my last nickel to call Steve. The box was empty, bar the usual cards, advertising the usual services of night. One lives for such small favours, such rewards. One lives for what night keeps up its loose sleeve. Steve, I said, come down, it's quite all right. There's no one here to speak of, just a queue waiting to get into a show. And they'll be gone once the door's open, it's just me and you. We will be reasoned, affectionate, polite. The stars collide and break up one by one. The street is empty now. I've seen the show already, and it's fine. There's a decent bar in the next block. I've seen the headlights close and vanish. There is nothing to be done. So Steve came down. It wasn't very far. And then it started raining, as it does. I felt a usual tightening in my throat. It was the same then as it ever was. It's what we were before. It's what we are. Let's talk, you and I, as if by rote. Let us repeat the words and walk past doors as if they weren't there and neither was the rain. These streets and bars are our familiar shores. But let's head out now, Steve. Go get your coat. This is mostly from the new book, Map of the Delta, and there's a section in there, but it's a book composed of sections, and one of the sections is to do with animals, their presence among us, the way we communicate with them, the way we look, what they become, when they're with us, and what we become, when we're with them, among the animals. Touch the animals in your head. They bend to you gently, as to food. They shuffle along from arc to arc, obedient as your own shadow. You feed the creatures with the pity they inspire, your imagined tribe. The domestic cat that winds its body around you and lives in your throat. The tame dog you feed that is your several limbs and your lifted head. And all the wild beasts in your eyes, what would you do with them? while you sleep. Here's the stuffed giraffe of your childhood, its long neck. Here is its faint smile. Here is the caged bird you spent such hours talking to. Will it now talk back? The inhabitants of your body have gathered in herds to hear you. What would you say? Now your languages have failed you and your eyes are lost. Creatures construct you. The world put you together as its quaint puzzle. Now you dismantle the night. Now you call the dark to its vast kennel. Your territory is crowded with animals that go their own ways. Behold your creatures, says the book of the body. Converse with your tribe. And this ties into a love poems a little bit. It's called courtship. It's looking at animal courtship and then compares it to sort of human courtship as well. One dreams of feathers, another of eggs and wings, another of nests. Some dream of flying, some of rising from the ground just an inch or two. There are rituals enacted in dizzy air between earth and sky. The infinite care of the act, the hovering involved, the desire and the becoming, the sheer resting of the air, the leaning on it. Is this how love burns, shimmering in its feathers, looking to touch down? Is there a landing that is all but permanent, some cry or scuffle of claw and feather, small beaks gaping in branches, then the urge to fly? 
we have heard them mourn, hidden in the trees, a thrill or a distant chatter. Open up the air, and there is a beating of wings, each feather a light. Read your two poems about the weather and the way it changes. So it comes, it One scene. The two next two poems are sort of connected. The thunder rolls down the hill of its own breathing. The darkness stiffens. If you stay still now, it will ignore you. Lightning will pass over you. Thunder's argument is with someone else. It is someone else's voice. There is another presence in the darkness. Look into its blind eyes. They look beyond you into a space so boundless, a voice can echo forever. Tiny selves of rain, tongues of lost mouth, sharp teeth of thunder, and a deep stomach that is part voice, part burning, all are gathered there. Breath, density, light. Thunder knows their names and yours, but will pass over. Thunder won't call you in from the rain or meet you at your open door. It's not meant for you. Thunder has priorities. You're not one of them. But it lives in you, <coughs> as if you were the echo blowing itself out. And this is listening to the weather. These poems were kind of, I suppose, inspired as the old sort of word, but, but they were began after the floods we had in Norfolk, the great rushing of the tide, with the tidal surge. <clears throat> Suddenly, words poured out of drains into gardens, too drenched to hear them. Trees and bushes were listening to the Urschsprache of rising thunder. The lake strained to hear the utterances of light spreading over it. The world was all ears, the fields preparing their notes for a bright future. But when the wind spoke loud and clear to a tumult of rain, the rain heard. And when the fields spoke water and the sky bellowed air, it was meaning. People were measuring the tides, calibrating loss by the yard and mile. There were the data, properly laid out and crunched into neat pie charts. Language was effort. The sky could say what it liked with its dark grammar of gesture and shift. We were at cross purposes, a longing for sun. In a way, as with the weather, and its threats and its impending nature. Um, so I guess with public life too. I've felt for quite a few years now that temporarily speaking we're moving backwards and we're moving into the 30s all over again. There are so many similarities, I don't just mean here, I mean back in my country of origin as well, even more so, alas. Um, this is the 30s. It was the 30s once again. Shop doors opened on hunger and long queues for soup. The poor, clothed by the same half-empty stores, stood round in doorways in a ragged group. The unemployed were drunk in railway stations. Rumours of war played in a constant loop. The furies were running out of patience, reduced to muttering curses, and the lost were lost in their own preoccupations. In feral offices, the rhyme cost of living was calculated down to pence by those who needed least and owned the most. Imperial glamour was the last defence. The cinema played all out games of doom on borrowed power. Even our dreams were dense, crowding us out of every empty room. We threw each other out for lack of rent. We were the bust remains of what was boom. And knowing this, that none of it was meant, not quite precisely, as the world turned out, but as a fanciful presentiment was of no consolation. 
None could doubt what was happening. The sea was emptiness out of which light emerged. One distant shout and it was here. The water's fancy dress of time as tide. The crowds along the street jostling to hear a demagogue's address. Where else was all the troubled world to meet? Why was the water rushing to the door? At whose damp walls were the loud waves to beat? This is a poem um, about a steeplejacks. It's a photograph of steeplejacks, a very old photograph and quite a well known one, but there are many like it. These guys up on the 50th or 60th floor, sitting out on a beam, no straps, no helmets, eating their sandwiches. Um, it's about them and it's about. Um, and I suppose it's what's the idea of aspiring to that, or what, is, or what constitutes a career. And if somebody asks in the school, so what do you want to be? That. Yeah. You see them perched in a row on a beam high above the city. They have no harness, no safety rail. They are munching sandwiches prepared by their wives 60 storey below or bought at an early morning stall. From there, they survey the world like gods without power, like flightless sparrows or shreds of wind-blown paper. At school, when asked about careers, they answered this, this girder, this vertiginous height, this pay, this beer, these sandwiches are what we aspire to. Life being short, and frequently shorter, occasionally abrupt, and always dangerous. This pride is what we master. This mustering of self and air, this and fatherhood or livelihood, the fight in the bar or the alley, the triumph or disaster of a joke, told to gods on the same high beam. We are born for this, to this. It is our station and pride, our working principle. The foreman strides among us, the boss approves the plans, the food appears on our plates. It is our domain. It is the urban wind that blows between streets that are yet to rise to their full stature. We hang between floors like decorations a rank of medals strung to a ragged chest. It is our choice. We make it. Then they descend, one by one, along more beams, down steps, resisting gravity, as they are obliged. Okay, I'm not going to do this modern technological thing of reading from here because he's a sort of new poems. And um, interesting, the God of Thunder will not blast me here. And, yeah, this is called The Burning of the House. The Burning of the House was the last thing. The blackened faces, limbs, and the charred ground covered in ash to smoke to maize eye sting. It runs a harsh truth down to the last pound. The pavement burns with sun, the walls are hot. The wound is raw, we leave things as they're found. We find them so, attend to them or not, and go about our business till it's a roll. There is no narrative, no scheme or plot, it's just a system, just another floor. They burn and burn, things go up in a flash. It is a debris that sticks in the craw. The burnt down matchsticks, ashtrays full of ash. The windings of the process, profit, loss. The broken sky, the smoke, the weightless cash that burns right down, but rises from the dross. Our throats are, our throats are parched. It's getting hard to breathe, though in the streets the branches lightly toss. And, um, oh, this is a very light little thing. I, I, I love coming across new shapes and forms, and each time it's like opening a box, and you think, well, 
what's in this one? Um, this is a cinquain, I'm told, it's, that's how it's pronounced. I always thought it was a chinquain or possibly a sanquain. Um, it's five lines, it's invented by an American woman who died quite young called Adelaide Crapsey, lived from 1878 to 1914, it's five lines. And the interesting thing about this, I'm explaining this technical thing, because it's one of the things that's lovely about it. It's only a five line long poem, and it has two syllables, and four syllables, and six syllables, and eight syllables, and two. And it comes back down to two, and it's a bit like so blowing up a balloon, and then letting the air out of it. It can do many things. I mean, she, she wrote some rather lovely ones. Um, so I'll read you two, and I'll read you one more after that, and that will be the end. Um, so this is called The Ridge. No insult intended. The Ridge, by lots of art. Sometimes they donate it. We are very grateful, of course. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not finished. The rich can be quite nice. They can smile with good teeth. They keep the fashion industry going. The rich will show their taste in cutting edge design, thus elevating the nation's standards. The rich spend their money, which keeps people in work. We are very glad we can work. Thank you. <laughs> The rich live on other planets, so they extend the universe. How wonderful that is. Far off galaxies glow with cash. On a clear night with a decent telescope, you see them. Learn to gauge your distance with cash, maybe they're from the rich. They are good at letting you know they are skilled at it. Social graces are gifts from the rich to the rest. It is a good thing that the rest behave. The rich like you, of course. They just don't know you're there. <laughs> Maybe they would like to see you. Stand up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the rich while you have them. You might never be so lucky again. <laughs> I'll read you two more poems and that's it. This is another um, Cinquaine, uh, of which whatever book comes next will contain a number of things here. Once you get into these things, you explore them. Um, and this is a piece written for a musician. It was an accordionist called Roman Upisay. It's called Random. And it's exactly the same formal arrangement, but it sounds quite different, I think. It's called Random. Random is as random does, a regathering, a bricolage, the nostalgia of chance. Objects become themselves, they return to nature, plastic toys, gift wrappings, thrashings, tippings, wind chimes, accordions, mouth organs and juice harps, tongs, bones, comb and paper, coke cans, fingers, bodies, limbs and organs, anything consciousness recognises as history or junk. They hold us, and we them, all that is physical and fraught with random qualities of loss. We stand at street corners, grazed by the wind, unwound by weather. The sheer randomness of air. It's good, isn't it, friends, to find constellations of chance events? Is anything better than here? But not quite here. A disquaint cross section of the familiar unknown moment, seeking the chance music of nothing much at all. The overwhelming, beautiful absence, helpless as anything, randomly nostalgic, strewn about the sky like music or light. I'll finish with A Return to Bad Machine, which was a sort of quite an experimental book for me. Um, This is a sonic, it's about colour, but it's about the names of colour. Names of colours. I spent some years writing sonnets about individual colours. I'd buy colour charts and look at colour charts and write those. 
But then in the end, there's also the sheer magic of naming and some of the joy and the pleasure of poetry, simply saying the damn words and getting the stuff out and loving the sound of it. So, this is called Colours, it's two sonnets. The first half is just the names of colours, most of which I've invented. So you'd have to imagine some colour charts there. And the second is a brief reflection on that, and that will be my thank you. Colours. Burleywood, Chartreuse, Gainsborough, Ghost White, Greenberg, Maroon, Orchid, Mocassin, Peru, Demosthenes, Snow, Papaya Whip, Popper, Peach Puff, Hot Pink, Hot Hot, Dark Red, Dark Grey, Dodger Blue, Drudgery, Derrida, Fuchsia, Fondle, Fricassee, Firebrick, Fanfall, Coral, Corn Silk, Crimson, Coleridge, Coolidge, Honeydew, Hellbore, Hartshorn, Honecker, Jet, Jellyby, <laughs> Lavender Blush, Lascar, Light Cyan, Light Light, Grey, Grey Green, Garrulous, Go Lightly, Garrick, Indignant, Insolence, Irked, Ivory, Ilk, Jeremiah, Asclepius, Goldenrod, Arivist, Glock, Cyan, Chocolate, Cadet Blue, Camisole, Fallen Grey, Flecked, Lost Blue, Amaretto, Shrubbery, Yearning, Absinthe, Abstinence, Grey Holes in Green. Had these been voices, the wind might have sunk them through a hedge or an empty head. It was winter, then spring, then summer, then autumn, thunder and lightning, the beating of a red drum. Had it been blue guitar or purple rose or black Sunday? Had it been brown study, devil's dyke or dun, as in dunnock? Had it been grey flower or red eye or permanganate or potassium? Had their names been their being? Had the retina been in service? Had the hot stores burned away with the seasons? Had it been anything but dinner in the provinces? Had the spectrum not gone awry? Had it ever fallen out like this, with the light lost in the jungle of the voice, with its brilliance and dust? Thank you for listening.